So, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to uh, quickly recap uh, uh, where I've been. So uh, uh, as I said, yeah, I did a, a few uh, successful companies. So I started like, uh, now it's like 17 years ago at Apple in uh, 2003. Actually, you know, uh, that's uh, 16 years ago. That's, it's been a long time. And then I, 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 I messed up a bit around in some smaller companies. And then I went to Mention, which, uh, which is a, was actually was a, uh, acquired recently, an e-founders company. And then I moved to the US uh, three years ago uh, for Segment and then for Drift. And I'm currently a free man working for my own. I'm doing some startup advisory. So um, the couple of things that I focus on. So I only do SaaS. Uh, and my, I define my job often when people ask me, what, what's your job? I say my, my job is to create a defensible moat through marketing. Uh, and, and my focus is, is dollars, it's revenue. So if we're talking of like uh, revenue and hyper growth, I just uh, so I was I joined Segment um, as the 50th employee, uh, and we went from 50 to 200 in uh, 18 months. I can't exactly tell you the revenue, obviously, but we did about uh, 3x revenue in 18 months. And then I left uh, Segment. I joined Drift as the 50th employee, and we went to 300 employees in 18 months, and that's about 5x in revenue uh, in 18 months, which is pretty fast. Um, and so if you're wondering like, how good is that, uh, well, it's fairly easy. Uh, uh, this is the key bank capital of market research from last, from last year. So it's uh, 2017 ending revenue uh, per, uh, per uh, revenue in millions. They have the growth rate. So this is like 10 to 20 million, that, that bucket here. Uh, segment at uh, uh, 3x in 18 months, this is one year, would be around here, right, around here. And drift would be somewhere well here at five x, right? Um, so it's uh, it's it's. If you look at the market, it's actually pretty rare, right? Uh, most of the startups that actually don't grow that fast at that scale, uh, or at all, by the way. Um, and so that is the, the this is the moat. So we're, today today we're going to talk about creating moats, uh, and the moat is the the, the blue lake around the castle. Um, but first, before talking about moats, I want to talk about what, uh, what defines me most. And what defines me most is uh, failing. Uh, I'm actually pretty good at failing. I fail uh, fairly often. Uh, and, uh, and I think failure defines me most than, than or actually better than successes. Uh, <clears throat> and growth teams fail a lot. Right? And when I think about failing, basically it's failing to my boss. Right? That's the only thing that really matters. Right? Uh, and so I always ask myself, what does, what does the boss want? Right? Um, and obviously the boss wants growth. He says, oh, do your growth things, those are magic things, right? But what the growth, what the, what the boss actually wants is, um, yeah, good KPIs. By good, what he or she means is revenue, right? Stuff that means revenue. Um, a prioritized roadmap. And what that means is, I want to know what you're working on, right? And a reliable forecast of impact, it means I want to know how much revenue you're going to make next month so I can allocate resources. If you ask for an, an extra engineer, I'm only going to give you that engineer if I know reliably that you will make me some revenue. And I have succeeded at failing on those three uh, uh, quite a few times. Um, so if we look at KPIs uh, first, um, you know, I, I look for actually like leading indicators of, uh, uh, of business. And I find just stuff like that. That's horrible. Um, and why is that horrible? If you just take traffic, for example, many people think of traffic like a leading indicator, right? Does traffic correlate well with revenue? No. I can create a lot of traffic that won't convert, right? A lot of shitty traffic. Um, is traffic uh, a good indicator of your team's efforts? No. I could buy a lot of traffic for peanuts. It doesn't mean I worked hard, right? Is traffic a good indicator of innovation? No. Right? So traffic is actually not a good indicator. And the same thing for leads, actually. So you should replace both of those by like qualified leads, or at least demos, which means you need to move down right, in the funnel. The problem with moving down is it becomes a lagging indicator. Right? It becomes super late, especially in SaaS, where like, revenue takes weeks, if not months, to realize from, from, your, um, from your efforts. Right? And so eventually what happens is you feel like this. You say, oh, I grew traffic. Well, I'm fantastic. I'm a, I'm a superhuman. Right? But it's your boss. Kind of feels like this, right? So it's like, what the hell is this guy saying, right? Uh, and, and that is something that you see often and often, right? Um, the second issue is prioritization, 
right? And if you think of like how growth teams work, uh, this is like a typical tool uh, for growth teams. It's actually Growth Hackers North Star, right? And I've, I've tried using that many times, right? And there's other ways to do it. If you can, there's people who do like spreadsheets like that. So it's like, what the hell is this? Um, or people who uh, do this, where they actually try to score all of the elements, right? But what's missing on all of those three, right? What's missing is that, what does score mean from like zero to 10? Is it good, is it bad? Like impact from two, three, nine, what does that mean? Can I report, oh boss, I've got an impact of three that's coming up. Does the boss gonna understand? No, the boss is not gonna understand. What the boss wants is revenue, right? That's the only thing the boss understands, right? If you look at, uh, look at uh, uh, ease, which is the effort, how many people is six? Is that like one engineer? Is that two engineers? Do you need more engineers? I don't know, right? And so I tried these models for a number of years and I failed, right? And I failed getting the team behind the tool, which is called the ICE tool, which is Impact, Conference, and Ease. But I, more, more especially, I failed actually communicating upwards um, the entire model. So I was failing completely, all right? And I'm gonna show you um, one last thing, um, which is the visibility and forecasting, all right? Um, there's a big difference between growth and product, right? The difference is that for products are supposed to make the right bets, all right? Analyze the data, talk to customers, and decide what they're going to work on. Growth is experimental by definition. You don't know what's going to work, right? If you know what's going to work, don't test it. You already know, all right? But if you don't know, expect to fail, all right? And so the entire, uh, uh, I'd say, mindset is that the more you try, the number of experiments defines your success better, right? If you have like um, fairly, uh, let's say, good odds, this presents a 50-50 odd. For context, in most startups that I talk to in the, in the Bay Area, the success rate of growth teams at the experiment level is about 20%. What that means is that we fail eight out of 10 times. If you go back here, think about this. Imagine you are the CEO and you have a PM. Imagine your PM has failed eight successive product launches. I can guarantee that PM is fired before he, he or she gets to the eighth launch, right? But that is the actual rate of success for growth teams, right? So these people are expected to fail, right? Um, and so that's what happens, right? We have bad KPIs, we don't know how to prioritize, we can't give a good forecast of our impact, which means we're not trusted, uh, and that's pretty much deserved, right? And so uh, I'm gonna give you a, a, a new process, right? Which is uh, answering those following questions, right? What are we working on? Um, are we working on the right things? What that means here is very important. Huh? Um, if you're not the founder of the company, well, two, two, two ways. If you're, if you're not the founder of the company, you know that you often in growth have the founder, the CEO, come to you and says, oh, I just talked to this guy or this girl and and I have this fantastic new idea, we're gonna do that tomorrow, right? If not today, this is fantastic, right? And like, you don't know, you don't know if it's gonna work, you actually don't want to do it, and you can't judge whether it's a good or bad idea, all right? Uh, if you're the founder of the company, stop doing that. Um, and forecasting, what's the impact gonna be in dollars? Uh, and if I give you another engineer, what, what is it gonna change? The process is as such, right? We have a little form, or we can, anyone in the company can submit an idea. You define the idea, you define the confidence. And then you have what looks like a spreadsheet, but it's actually much better, right? And I'm gonna walk you through it. But basically you have all of the ideas, you have the revenue per day of work here, right? The teams, the description, let's walk through that actually. I made a little gift for you guys. So you have all the ideas, you have who submitted the idea, you have the owner of the idea who's gonna work on it, a description, the hypothesis. We have the confidence, how likely is it to succeed, all right? Then we have the weighted revenue. I'm gonna show you how it works. I can sum that to know how much pipeline I have. I have the days to build. Uh, I have what metric are impacting, or impacting like signups. Let me go back a second on this one. Oh, let me pause that here. So which metric are impacting, right? Are we impacting signups, are we impacting Qualified setups or demos, how many days of engineer do we need to actually deliver that idea? 
how many of that object are we going to impact? So this is going to drive 31 new signups, this idea here. And you can see that compared to the total volume of signups, it's a plus 9.9% uh, increase, right? Um, and if you wonder, well, how does that work? Well, we have another table, uh, which is called impact metrics up here, uh, where we have all of those, all of the metrics, signups, we've got the total volume of signups, we have the total revenue of signups, you divide one by the other, you get the value per signup. And you have that for all of the funnel. The entire funnel is presented here with the revenue per object at each stage, down to the demos, right? So when I have an idea, I say, well, what is that going to improve? And I can then um, list that idea, and I can say, how many is that going to add? You go back to the master list, you can say, well, this is adding 31 signups, 9.9% increase over baseline. And then you can look back at the weighted average. And the weighted average is how you actual, you multiply the value that you had earlier times the confidence times, um, and divided sorry, by the days to build, right, for the day, the day work. And so this tells you, well, this is like 31 signups um, multiplied by 141, right, multiplied by 50%. So this gives you like a weighted uh, value. And here, you actually divide that by the number of days to build, which is five, right? So now we can prioritize which idea is going to bring me more revenue per day of work, which is what we should be focusing on, right? And you can also sum up the column and say, how, how many dollars do I have in my entire pipeline? Which means you can be like a sales team, right? And this is very important because now, as a head of growth, I can actually commit to my boss if you look here at my column impact approved, I have $282,000 of revenue in pipe over 30 days of work, all right? Um, which is super clear. I know exactly what we're gonna work on and I know why I'm working on it. And if I go back to what I said previously about uh, the boss coming to me with a shiny new idea, I have the boss fill the form, the boss is gonna put the hypothesis, right? And if the boss's idea falls at the bottom, I say, I'm sorry boss, I can't do it. It's not the, it's not the best idea we have. If the boss really wants to do it, I say, well, sure, change the hypothesis so that it looks better. Commit, right? Since we all commit on revenue. Uh, it also means that on my team, I can actually give bonuses to my engineers based on their actual revenue per day of work, right? The more they produce revenue, the more they get paid, just like salespeople. So my engineers are becoming or actually thinking like salespeople. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, that's a new process that I have not built this. Uh, this actually comes from Dropbox. So my friend uh, Darius uh, from Dropbox actually built this in our table. And you have all the stages, what we're building right now. You can see we're building 229 over 13 days, or what we have done in the past, uh, and how many days we have built. So all the stages and all the revenue. Um, what you saw earlier in terms of revenue per day of work is a copy of the sales velocity. So in the sales world, sales velocity is a, a measure of revenue speed. Right, which is the number of leads times the ACV times the conversion rate divided by times conversion. We copied that for growth. We take, we talk, we're taking the impact metrics count times the value of that metric times the success confidence divided by uh, time to build in days. Gives us the growth velocity. It means we can compare people to one another. Is one engineer uh, bringing more revenue per day of work than another one? All right. And as I said, I can now commit to my boss at least one month ahead of time on the revenue we're going to bring, right? So we have commitments uh, and we can hire against that. The boss can tell me, for example, if I give you another engineer, what does that do? Well, so it's easy. Another engineer is 20 days of work. So I can take my pipeline. I can say, what can I bring down in 20 days that I couldn't before? And how much revenue is that? So, um, and so to conclude on that, it means this new process gives us uh, an ali it's aligned on the sales structure, right? Which everyone understands, so it's not something new. It's predictable, and there's commitment. So back to moats now. So I presented how we work, and I want to go back to, to moats. Um, and, uh, and first, to talk about moats, um, I want to talk about the challenge we have, which is uh, for entrepreneurs, mostly, especially in France, um, especially in France, we love building products. 
We love building products, right? And marketing is often an afterthought, right? We're way better at, at building products than we are at doing marketing, right? And, and we forget that marketing uh, not just can, but should be a competitive advantage, right? Um, and I'm going to prove that by asking a question to the audience. So here, who buys SaaS here? Can we have a show of hands? Can we raise the hands? Who buys SaaS? Okay. Who of those people actually enjoy the, the, the SaaS buying experience? I have one guy for Roman back there. I have two few people. Yeah. And so it's not just you, you, you usually that, that hates the buying process. Right? The, the 2015 Forrester survey shows us that 53% of B2B buyers prefer researching data on their own. Right? So half of the people in 2015 don't like the buying experience in B2B. And 2017, it's 68%. So actually, the, the dislike or the mistrust right, is going up. Right? People hate the buying process more and more. 70%, right? um, that's 2015. Right? Start with a generic query. They're not searching for your brand. And so the truth is that your website or your marketing is the last place people go for buying. Right? They go, so the good example is that when you go to a hotel, think as a consumer, because we're all consumers. When you're going to book a hotel, what do you do? do you, are you going to see the reviews on the review website first? Or are you going to check the marketing photos on the hotel's website? Right? The entire market, I don't know about you guys, but the, the entire market has moved to reviews, for sure, right? The SaaS market, the B2B market, has done the same thing, right? It has moved to stuff like G2 Crowd and reading like reviews and, and articles on the software before signing up, right? That's what's happening. So we don't, people as consumers, as buyers, we don't trust marketing anymore, right? And, and to be honest, like we call that on ourselves, right? We know to all, we need to own this, like, I need to own this. Like I've created that situation of mistrust by sending a ton of spam, by overselling, uh, by overpromising on my product, right? Uh, and one of the challenges is that we need to innovate, and we don't innovate, right? Marketing mostly is copying what other people do, right? And that's that's just terrible, right? Um, one good parallel about that. Okay, most people here build products, right? How often? Do you think a good strategy is, hey, I'm going to copy the other person's product and make it mine, right? Almost never, right? At least in the same market. You, just, you never just say, my entire strategy is copying someone else and doing the same thing, right? You have one angle of innovation. Maybe it can be pricing. Maybe it can be uh, market geography, right? But you have one angle. In marketing, very often you say, oh, this looks like a nice website. I'm going to have the same, right? And that's just terrible. We just don't innovate at all. And who wins when we don't innovate? Right? The who wins is easy. We just spend all our money on Google and Facebook. Like the entire, like if you look at that, that's like 50, that's 60% of the entire spend, advertising spend that goes just to two companies. Right? Which means we're taking the money from our VCs and we're just sending it to Google and Facebook. Right? Um, which is insane. And that's because we're not innovating. Right? We're not doing anything to change that. Right? Um, and if you look at, at that stat, that is from uh, last year. This is a customer acquisition cost um, as of last year. You can see here that um, the, uh, the blended CAC relative to four years ago, which was zero, has actually gone up uh, almost 70%. Right? Uh, and it's the same, about with B2B and B uh, same thing for B2B and B2C. The cost of acquiring customers is going up for two reasons. One, because there's no diversity in, in paid marketing, and two, because the other channels are disappearing because we're not innovating, <coughs> right? And look, where people, where CMOs uh, in the US are spending their budget, uh, between 2017 and 2018, actually are spending less on all categories but MarTech. MarTech is the only category that, go, that goes up, right? So we're actually replacing humans and paid by technology and software. Which is good of you. It's really good for those of you who sell software, uh, uh, including me. It's less good for the others, right? But we need to realize that, right? And so it means as as a market, all companies are becoming more and more advanced, sophisticated, and you need to react to that. If you're not using software, it means you're still actually taking on the cost of labor, humans. You're going to lose, right? 
And the last thing, right, lack of innovation is this, all right? Uh, Andrew Chen, uh, who was previously at, at Uber, uh, now is at Anderson Horowitz, actually told us that uh, over time, all marketing strategies result in shitty click-throughs, right? This is the very first banner ad in 1994, right? This, the very first banner ad. It had a click-through rate, a CTR of 78%. Think about that, right? I don't, I, I, I've been in marketing for, for like 15 years. I have never seen anything with a click-through rate of 78%. Anything, right? Um, and all strategies tend to do like that, like outbound emails, videos, a new ad object, whatever, everything goes down, right? And so if you're just lagging the market and copying what others do, right, what happens is that, imagine this is like your one of new strategy and they have mass click-through rate. If you come in and you're two, you're three, you're gonna have maybe half of the click-through rates. So you're, you're actually losing that competitive edge. So that's for the lack to innovate, right? So let's talk a bit about, uh, about some innovation uh, that uh, I can bring um, to you and some of, some of it is what you need to build yourself. Um, so most of you have already heard about the review loop, so I'm just gonna spend one slide on that. Something that uh, I've talked about many, many times. And it's, it's uh, fairly simple. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that you uh, take the IP address of people that come to your website, Right? Uh, you send to Clearbit, you get the domain back, you take the domain, you score it with Matt Kudu, uh, and then you take that score and you prospect. What that means is that you're sending outbound emails to visitors of your website. People who visit your website have not engaged, have not filled the form, you can send to their companies an email because you know that there was interest in your business. Right? This has one of the highest click-through rates uh, of uh, what I do um, in my business. So that's something I did like a couple of years ago. I did a new review loop, which is a private one. Um, what I mean by private is for specific for one company. And this is interesting because in B2B, most of the time you have a finite uh, TAM. TAM is total addressable market, right? You have a, a target market, which is fairly well defined, which means you know all pos possible customers all possible accounts or companies in that market, right? Um, and it, when that is true, everything's possible, right? You could enrich, you could create a database ahead of time of all those customers, and you could say, where are they located? Right, what's their H HQ address? What do they have in common? Can I create a scoring model, right? And so I did something like that. I said, well, easy, let's take the IP address, right? Let's actually, of uh, people who come to my website, let's hit DBIP to get the geolocation, Let's create a database with all the customers in the market, all right? Let's enrich that with their HQ address, all right? Let's get the XY uh, coordinates of the HQ address. Let's get the XY coordinates of the IP address. And because it's a small target market of like tens, 20, 30,000 companies, let's see if the distance is small enough between both and we're, we're within uh, an acceptable distance, we can make a fuzzy match saying, this is probably that company. Right? And to be more precise, what we did is that we actually analyzed within the, the total market. We had, we had a, a total market of 30,000 uh, companies. We looked at all of the XY coordinates. We uh, looked at the uh, average distance between one company and the nearest neighbor. Right? And then we looked at that, that distance in, in kilometers. Now we look at the distance between the geolock and the database. And if that new distance is lower than the nearest neighbor distance, we have a probable match. Um, so, yeah, and then we prospect with emails, right? This gives us a, a super high match rate, uh, of course, provided it's only in a, in a, in a specific time. Uh, we talked about, uh, also about understanding the value of our customers, right? And, and this is something I, I have shared a few times, but I think it's really important. Um, and so when you do marketing, you have, um, imagine you have a lead coming to your website and signing up, right? Um, maybe through a, a paid campaign. Right? <clears throat> Most of the time, you don't know, you don't know ahead of time if this is going to be profitable or not. You don't know before the lead signs up, goes to a demo and pays, which can take weeks, right? And so you can have maybe a lead which is like profitable because like in the end, the value of the lead is, is, is lower than the cost of selling. Maybe you, you could be losing money, right? The, it's unprofitable, which is like the, the value of the lead is lower than, than the cost of selling. Right, of acquiring and selling, right? And the challenge is that you, you, you don't really know uh, which is which uh, because 
uh, you, don't, uh, you don't have a good understanding of that. What happens is you have something like this, right? You have all of your leads on a map, right? Uh, and before you sell to them, there's just no data. And what I've done with my friends at Matku, which I can share here now, is we've actually done a regression, uh, which is what that business is. And we've done a scoring model where we can predict at the moment of sign up the value of each lead. And we are actually able to predict 80% of the value within 16% of the leads. Now, if you remember what I shared with you earlier in my growth model, you saw I had the value of the lead at each stage of the funnel. This is where it comes from. All right? This is actually something I did with Mad Kudu three years ago, and I've reused recently in my ability to forecast the value of each experiment. If you go here, it means you can actually place all of the customers on that line to know the exact value in dollars at the customer level, right? And what that means is we can actually create separate experiences. One of the big problems that we have uh, in marketing is that we expect customers who are very different. Each customer is very different, right? You have maybe a large company, a small company. You might have somebody, a company who's advanced. You have a very wide product, very wide audience. We expect them to all like the same marketing on our website, which is just not true. Right? And so you should start thinking, well, if I have a very high value prospect, maybe I should have like an ABM strategy for them. Right? And if I have a low value prospect, maybe I should have marketing automation for them. Right? If you can score them, it means you can actually split that experience fairly early in your funnel. But if you're good and you're able to have a value at each lead, you can actually cut your funnel right, at the very top in as many buckets as you want. And you can start having a very uh, adapted, uh, personalized uh, experience based on the lead value. What's interesting is that if your competitors don't do that, if they don't innovate, and they have a very flat cost per lead, right? And so they're spending, they have a budget per lead, which is fairly fixed. And you can actually adapt it. What, is, what, what it means here is that here, in that entire space here, your competitors are underspending. If they underspend, you're going to win. You're going to give them a better, you're going to give your future customers a better experience. Here, this space here, they are overspending. Right? They're spending more than the value of the lead. They're losing money. Right? If you can cut that in as many buckets, right, and you can actually follow that line, you're going to force your competitors to either overspend or retreat from the market. And it's not, it's not rocket science. Right? Um, we're just bidding the right amount. If you wonder where that comes from, um, it's easy. Right? It's, we copied B2C bid optimization. Right? If you think of Criteo, that's what Criteo does. And Criteo does a prediction of the value of each visitor and then creates uh, a bid to place an ad. I've just done the same thing, but applied to the entire marketing strategy. We are trying to place a bid, to make a prediction, and place a bid on each uh, visitor. Your entire market, you can take your database of all your possible customers, run it through this regression model, and say, what's the value of each company? Now that you know the value of each company, what are you ready to spend 30% of the future revenue? And how can you spend that money? Right? That's what you should ask yourself. One way that I found how to do that is to actually start buying third-party intent data to understand within my TAM, there could be very good companies, but they're not, they might not have intent. Right? Um, if you look at your funnel, and ask you, like, where does it start? Right? And you might wonder, well, it's fairly easy, right? It, it starts at the top, right? And I'm going to say, well, that's wrong. Your funnel actually starts before. If you remember what I said earlier on review websites, and, oops, and, um, and I'm going to need a charger. <laughs> just grab the, a um, USB-C charger. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Um, if you just think of... Um, <clears throat> review websites. Review websites uh, actually are up here, right? It's the people actually looking for information and insights before they come to you, right? And so you, now you you should ask yourself, well, how do I capture that information, right? Um, how how do I get? Uh, there you go. Thank you. Perfect. Um, how do you know? And I looked at the data, and actually I got some data from Google. And B2B buyers do 12 searches before engaging with a brand. 12 searches. 
You might think that's actually a high number. I'm going to say, not really. I looked into the data on the B2C side, and there was a rising search in San Francisco, which is best salt, le meilleur sel. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, who's searching for best salt? A lot of people are looking on review websites for the best salt, right? So if people have the time to search for what is the best salt, they have the time to do look at reviews for your software. They sure have the time, right? 12 searches. And so you're wondering, well, I'm at the end. This is your website at the end, engagement. How can you actually get before your competitors in touch with the customer, right? Um, and that's something that I've done. And if you think of what I did before, of actually taking the people who visit your website with the IP address and the geolocation and all of that, right? And prospecting and scoring them, that's too late. That is after the 12 steps. What I want is actually move that prospection like up to the top. And so I've actually built partnerships and started um, taking in all the data from all of those sources and many more, and actually start my detection process at the very first touch before they come to me. Right? Which that means is that I can actually know which companies are interested in my software or software like mine before they tell me. All right? So a couple of examples I've done in the past, stuff like Datanize, where I take the, the, the data um, from Datanize, it's basically who's installing what, right? which software they're installing or uninstalling. All right? uh, any, any JavaScript that's on the website, Datanize will tell me. So I can build a competitive campaign which is very simple, which is, so if you think of my time at uh, Drift, for example, is someone uh, removing intercom? Is someone adding intercom? Has someone added intercom 10 months ago? Why 10 months? Because it's yearly contracts. They're going to go in a renewal in two months. Which means I can come in with a low ball offer, and actually do a 30% discount, and I can force my competitor into two things. Either I'm forcing them to churn, right, which is good for me, or I'm forcing them to, like, uh, I'm dragging their prices down, which is also a revenue churn, which is good for me, for the cost of a campaign, right? Um, stuff like G2Crowd, like each time that my logo is displayed, I have a hit in the API. This is actually Informatica. So Informatica, this is actually the actual data. You can see all, I, can, I get the data on all of the live chat tools that they have visited, right? I get all of that intent. And I can build regression models based on that intent, which is super clear. Like this company is in a, live chat buying process. There's no doubt about that. Any salesperson who sees that is going to give them a call, right? Data from Product Hunt. Most of you here who do software or products know Product Hunt. There's actually a free API. You can know who has upvoted, and I will automatically scrape that entire list of upvotes of my product and my competitor's product. Of course I want to know who upvoted my competitors. I want to know if some of my customers upvote my competitors because I send that as a churn signal to my CSMs, all right? LinkedIn, it's fantastic. Like in my former company, we did a lot of LinkedIn. You can see here the, the, the VP of marketing of uh, Drift. Like he does videos with like 2,000 comments and 300,000 views, all right? All I do is that we take all of the likes, all of the comments, we scrape all of that. And then art with a French company, by the way, called Phantom Buster. And automatically, we then email uh, either by email or on LinkedIn directly, all the people who actually uh, liked the content uh, saying, hey, hey, Andrew, thank you very much for, uh, for upvoting the video from our CEO or VP of marketing. Uh, I would love to chat more. It's super personalized. It's super, it's like on spot in the right channel, right? Uh, Bombora tells us what people are reading on the web, right? So if, co if a company is reading a lot of a new topic, I will know about it. Um, and I've got stuff like SEMrush, which tells me, like, what are they spending on Google AdWords? So if you look here at Informatica, Informatica, they, they are spending $27 per click on data integration, right? This is great insight. Are they increasing their spend, right? I can use that if I'm selling a product that competes with that. Uh, predict leads, who are they hiring? This is super important. Because most people who sell software, uh, for example, here, right? Here we're in the, the office of Forest Admin, right? They sell software, right? When can you actually push a significant change in an organization, such as a new admin or when I was at Segment, right? Usually you can push a new change 
when there's a, a new uh, leadership, right? That's when change happens, right? It's much easier. And so we look on leadership changes, like a new VP of uh, data integration, uh, a new VP of ops, something like that. We know change is coming because no one will oppose decisions from that person. You're not going to hire someone and say no immediately right, to what they're doing. Uh, and so data, we send them our entire customer list and they tell us, hey, this person has left the company, which forces us to do two things. One, look for a new champion within the company. And two, if that person had a high NPS score, if that person was happy, well, we send them a new headset, brand new headset at their new office address, say, hey, we love you. Uh, we hope you loved the software in the past. Let's stay in touch. Right? And we hope to be able to send them a headset in the very first week they start their new job. Right? Super memorable. Uh, and last thing is, is hyperpersonalization. Right? So you capture a lot of data. It's great. You capture all that data, you put it, you, you, you take it in, right? And you wonder, like, well, how do I use it in, in, in my outreach? Well, um, this is an example of the emails that I have built at, my, at my, uh, uh, one of my former uh, companies, right? And you can see here, hey, it's a good email, you know, it, it's okay. It uses a lot of merge tags uh, and, you know, it's sent to the right person at the right time. Uh, you know, it merges the data from the company, from that person, the technology they use. So it's a fairly good email. It's not perfect though, right? Because if you look at, you know, if, if you ask yourself, you know, what salespeople do, good salespeople these days, they're going to send some kind of illustration. They're going to show it's human, right? It's very important to understand that. Email open rate is extremely tied to the perception of humanness, right? If you're convinced it's built by a robot, it's automated, the chances of opening go down dramatically, right? If you're convinced it's sent by a human, you're going to open it. I'm going to give you one example. Uh, if you receive a, um, a letter, a handwritten letter, and you're convinced it's from someone, right? Someone wrote it. How likely are you going to take that letter and put it in the trash before opening it? Very unlikely, right? Why is that? It's because you and your brain think someone actually took the time to write that email, that, that letter, sorry, uh, that handwritten letter, and it would be an offense to ignore that effort. Right? And so we value somebody else's effort. If it's automated, you don't care because you don't value the machine's effort. Right? That's more or less how we think. Right? And that is just reciprocity. Um, and an illustration is one way salespeople and humans use to show that they have spent time to create that reciprocity and create relevance. And if you look at the salespeople at Drift, uh, what they do is they, um, this is sped up 3x, they're going to give the a prospect, a preview of what Drift would look like on their site. And so they actually configure an entire instance of the app, right? Uh, and they're going to slap it over a preview of the website, and they're going to take a screenshot, and they're going to merge that into the email, right? And doing that increases the uh, open rate, uh, sorry, the response rate significantly, right? Very significantly, but it takes a lot of time. It takes an average like three to five minutes uh, to do that. And so they have a limited, they're not going to do it that often, right? And so then they, they, build the e they put the email in Gmail and blah, blah, blah. And then they, they, they drop the, uh, the, the image, right? Um, up, there you go. Take a screenshot, drop it here. And now you have the preview of Drift on, on the website, right? It takes some time. So most of it, most of them are not going to do it that often, right? And so you think, what can I do? Well, let's think about that, right? What is in the image? A screenshot, the customer's logo, the preview of my product. Can't I automate that? Of course, right? And so what we do is that we, we built a script that automates the entire process and gives the perception of humanness uh, in my email by building a preview which is, and you can then create an email which is super personalized in the text and personalized in the illustration. Right? And you can say, hey, I built this preview for you. Right? And you're going to say, well, gee, like, you're destroying the perception because now people will know it's automated. And so, exactly. That's my entire point, is that if you think back to the curve of the decay effect of innovation, 
I'm actually forcing all the others to react. And so by destroying what my competitors do with their salespeople, I'm destroying their ability to sell. All right? um, and I merge that email here. Right? And so this email is as good as what salespeople could do. It has personalized text, it has the right technologies, and it has the right screenshots. And it took one second for a script to build. Right? And it kills most salespeople. Right? Uh, and again, granted, two years from now, that will be worthless. Right? And I will have moved to something else. Um, the interesting thing is that we actually started saying those. And you look at, these are uh, your Slack messages from Drift's sales team. And what did they say? And they say, hey, I just got a sick, me a sick meeting due to automation, like blah, blah, blah. And someone else is saying, like, is that email from growth? So the humans inside Drift's team can't even tell anymore who sent the email. They don't really know, which means we have reached Turing's, Turing's uh, test, right? Where we are fooling our own humans on the automation, right? Uh, and customers here are saying, like, how do you end up, how are you doing that email? It's really well targeted and, and well written, right? Um, so we are actually at the point where right now we are sending the right quality to create doubt and have people engage. Um, so if you think about what we're doing, we're just taking the website, right, visits, um, or the intent, and we're actually storing, prospecting, and sending emails, right? And you can actually go further. You can say, well, this is like collection, this is action. And so I can actually uh, increase my action to send more than just emails. I can send some chats, I can send some uh, advertising or some uh, uh, goods, some gifts, right? Um, and a few examples of that um, that I'm going to quickly over. This is the chat here. Uh, this chat is based on the prediction of the value at the time of visit. So we talked about how we predict who's coming on the site. We're using the same regression of the value per company because we know who's coming. And we're powering the chat dynamically with the right content that you would have in the email because we pre-compute the entire uh, calculation for outbound because we already know who's in the market. Right? And the same thing is true. Um, this is one example in the chat because I know the value ahead of time to people coming on my site. I know this visitor's value is probably like $300. So I'm ready to spend, let's say, $30. What can I do with $30? How can I create a differentiated experience? That's one example that I did a couple of years ago, which is instead of having a chat that says, hey, how can I help you? I did a chat that says, hey, how do you like your coffee? Which is a really weird question to ask, right? Because people are coming on, on Segment's website, that was Segment at the time, think, what the hell do you mean? What, what, how do I like my coffee? Like, I'm on a B2B website. And the chat bot says, yeah, like, how do you like your coffee? And people say, oh, I like it black, I like it like, with milk. And it's actually building an order because we know the IP address, we know the, uh, the business, we know the HQ address. We can actually deliver coffee in about 15 minutes in, in most HQ uh, addresses in, in cities in the US through Postmates. Right? And so the chat bot is delivering coffees to people that have a high predicted value. Right? And it is totally worth it because it costs only 15 bucks and it is very memorable. So I'm just trying to create a memorable experience. Um, and yeah, doing stuff like, again, because we can pre-compute the value, uh, we can actually change the entire website when somebody comes to us. So an example of that is, well, imagine a large company like Salesforce comes to Segment's website, right? Do you want them to see that there is like a $99 plan? No, right? Because what are they going to feel? They're going to feel, oh, this is not for us, right? This is like small business stuff, right? So what do we do? Well, because we know that they have a very high predicted average revenue, we're going to hide the pricing page. We're going to remove the pricing page. We're going to remove the uh, get started and the uh, uh, tried for free buttons. And we're going to have a very businessy website which says, get a demo, talk to us, no pricing. Because that's what people do on very high end business, right? And so we adapt the website dynamically based on that prediction. Um, and last but not least, uh, we actually send those handwritten letters, but we don't write them ourselves, right? There's an API through Sendozo, and we have humans in the US. This is $5. For us, this, this is an, this is an uh, API call with the content, the same content that would be sent in the email. We actually have a human write it, stamp it, and send it through the, uh, through, through the post mail. 
right, for five dollars, right? Again, trying to like be memorable. Uh, I'm just going to skip some of that. And so basically, uh, what we're doing is that we're predicting the value of the lead based on the signals, right? We're building a score. The more we have signals, the more we are confident on the score, right? Um, and the more we have signals, of course, the more we can compute the value, right? So we say, well, this at that stage of two signals, we know that's 200 bucks. Maybe this is like 350 bucks, which means we can invest an increasing amount. If you go back to what I said earlier with that curve and the, all of the buckets, this is how I do it. I know exactly within my TAM who is where in their buying cycle, right? Um, and one uh, last example of, um, of leveraging that is actually uh, pushing that data to Facebook for advertising. And you're gonna say, well, you told us not to spend too much on Facebook, right? Um, I said, true, but we do it a bit differently. What we do is that we send to Facebook, and as a forward, uh, Facebook does not work very well for B2B most of the time because Facebook's acquisition is meant for B2C, right? And it's meant to receive conversion values conversion events from e-commerce, right? Uh, like you're buying shoes, right? And it's meant for that because it has a seven day conversion window. You can only send conversions within seven days after the click, right? And you need to send those conversions client side from the browser, right? And in, uh, in B2B, you don't have conversions within seven days and they don't happen client side, right? They happen you know, over the phone, maybe in Salesforce, maybe in your app, but they don't happen within seven days, which means you can't send back conversions to Facebook and it just doesn't work that well. So what we're doing is that because we can make the prediction uh, at the moment of visit, at the moment of, of sign up on our site, we actually send back a fake conversion to Facebook with a prediction value saying that they're buying shoes. So we actually registered on Facebook as an e-commerce store selling shoes, all right? We're sending back a, a fake e-commerce conversion and say, hey, they bought shoes for 200 bucks, all right? Which is not true. It doesn't matter because we actually are very confident on our model and we're actually training Facebook's ML based on our own ML, and it actually has led to about a 3x, three times decrease in cost per lead uh, on uh, Facebook. Right? So we're acquiring leads at one third the cost of our competitors, which is one hell of a moat. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, we're just doing what B2C does again, but for B2B. I'm trying to copy uh, those, those learnings, and, um, and that's about it. Um, I have a few other things, but they are only if you ask questions. Uh, so we covered a lot, we did 97 slides uh, in about uh, one hour. So if you have any questions, shoot, and I can answer in French aussi. Du coup. <laughs> Merci. En tant que grosse ouais. entre, entre 50e et, et combien de deuxième Je suis pas à 10e. Euh, enfin, enfin, alors, euh, ouais, euh, je suis. Alors, par exemple, chez Mansion, j'étais 10e employé. Euh, ça dépend énormément de la, de, la, de la courbe de croissance de la boîte. Ce qui est un peu ironique parce que le job de growth est comme de la créer cette courbe. Euh, mais c'est surtout une question de moyens. Euh, le but du jeu, en fait, c'est d'arriver pas trop tard. C'est qu'en fait, la boîte se structure très vite. C'est-à-dire, au-delà de, au de 70, 100 employés, c'est déjà plus ou moins structuré. Et c'est très, très dur d'avoir une équipe growth. Le principe de l'équipe growth, c'est d'être très transversal. Hein, c'est de créer, euh, d'avoir une compréhension du life cycle de client, genre de, de A à Z, hein, euh, de, de pouvoir créer cette expérience unique de bout en bout. Et, et en fait, s'il y a déjà une équipe marketing, une équipe sales, une équipe euh, customer success, euh, et on va créer cette équipe grosse, ben, en fait, on va, on va marcher sur les pas de bande des autres. Et ça, c'est très compliqué. Et donc, du coup, il faut arriver à créer dans la culture d'entreprise relativement tôt euh, cette valeur d'innovation et d'échec qui va avec. Voilà. 10, le problème, c'est que généralement, il n'y a pas de moyens. Il y a peu de ressources. La plupart de ce que j'ai montré là, en tout cas, c'est relativement très technologique. Donc, il faut, de, il faut au moins un ou une ingénieur. Euh, et à 10, dédier une ressource d'ingénierie à l'équipe grosse, pas facile. Voilà. Et donc du coup, ça veut dire que tu vas euh, passer par une phase, euh, je dirais, difficile pendant quelques mois. Euh, et la question, c'est est-ce que tu es capable d'avoir des résultats 
Euh, et souvent, euh, notamment, bah, c'est mon, mon copain Sean qui était le Head of Growth de Atlassian qui dit, quand il rejoint une boîte, il veut avoir deux succès le premier trimestre. C'est deux, deux, deux vrais succès. Et il dit, moi, mon success rate, c'est 10%. Voilà. Euh, ce qui veut dire qu'il faut que je teste 20 idées. Voilà. Et donc, il faut qu'il y ait assez de ressources pour pouvoir tester 20 idées le premier trimestre. Ce qui n'est pas, pas évident. Voilà. Euh, donc, il faut se poser cette question. Du coup, en fait, combien d'idées je vais pouvoir tester Est-ce que je suis vraiment dans une logique de test ou est-ce qu'en fait, je suis en train de faire le product market fit euh, Et souvent, à 10, il n'y a pas encore vraiment de product market fit. Voilà. Et dans ce cas, ce n'est pas un job de growth, c'est plutôt un job de marketing. Donc, je moi, en tout cas, personnellement, j'essaie d'arriver plus tard. J'essaie d'arriver vers 30 euh, au moment où il y, y a un product market fit, il y a des moyens, mais ce n'est pas structuré. Il n'y a pas encore de choix technologique, il n'y a pas de choix humain et compagnie. Je pense qu'une partie du sales est mort, clairement. Je pense que la partie du sales qui est d'envoyer de, des emails à la main euh, pour créer du lead, euh, celle-là est morte. C'est clair. En fait, il n'y a aucune valeur humaine là-dedans. Euh, il va en rester un petit peu à la marge, vraiment sur les, le, le côté très enterprise, euh, où ouais, c'est très personnalisé, ils ont le temps et tout. Mais le sales junior, on lui dit tiens, va dans LinkedIn et trouve-moi des clients, hum, valeur zéro. Voilà, c'est impossible de générer du client là-dedans. Et ce qui, ce qui était une, une partie du taf quand même. Hein. Euh, et donc, du coup, qu'est-ce qui reste En fait, il reste la partie qu'on ne peut pas automatiser avant un très très longtemps, qui est la relation humaine. C'est à partir du moment où le lead est qualifié, le lead a de l'intention et il a levé la main en disant Oui, ok, j'ai envie de vous parler, je veux une démo. Bah là, quand même, euh, là, il faut mettre un humain. Mais donc, du coup, sur, tu penses à ton funnel, euh, tous le les deux, trois premières étapes du funnel sont, sont automatisées. Quoi. Euh, sur un autre sujet, sur le gros modèle que tu as montré. Ouais. Euh, en gros, c'est très clair, tu as ton euh, prix par lead à ce moment du funnel, ouais. tu as euh, ton conversion rate. Ouais. Euh, comment est-ce que, euh, est que tu fais le sizing de l'idée enfin, De l'idée comment... Ouais, de, de, de chaque idée, tu veux dire. Comment est-ce que je dis cette idée, c'est 30 sign up et compagnie Ouais, quand tu dis cette idée, il va, va faire passer de 9 à 10 Ouais, alors ça qui est intéressant en fait, et c'est, je peux faire une démo d'ailleurs. Euh, Donc ça, c'est la table, par exemple, tu vois. Et donc, du coup, on va, euh, on va prendre un truc simple qui est le Google One Tap Sign Up. Euh, donc, on prend une idée. Google One Tap, je vais vous faire un plus plus pour que vous puissiez voir. Voilà. Euh, et donc là, tu vois qu'on a dit que c'était euh, 30% sur 100 Sign Ups par mois. La question, c'est comment on arrive à 100 Sign Ups par mois. Bon, alors on essaie à chaque fois de savoir. Là, par exemple, ça, ce chemimique, pour ceux qui ne savent pas, c'est un truc énorme. Donc, on va aller là. Voilà. Ça, c'est le truc... Euh, qui, qui a été lancé dernièrement par Google et qui permet de faire un sign-up, euh, ce machin-là, là. ce truc-là, là, où en fait on voit directement euh, les différents profils qu'on a, on, a, on clique, on n'a plus de pop-in, on n'a plus rien et hop, on, ça passe directement. Bon, et là, quand je regarde les copains, quand je regarde ce qu'ils disent là, ils disent bon, là, nous on a réussi à faire euh, plus 118%. Et je me dis, ah, oh, 118% quand même, c'est ballsy, euh, ça me semble beaucoup, tu vois. Et donc moi, je demande à chacune de mes équipes de faire une hypothèse. Un, une petite explication mathématique. Donc, opportunity size math. Tu vois, je dis OK, il y a des websites qui disent 118. Moi, je vais être conservatif, je vais dire 30%. Je pars sur 30%. Chaque idée a cette petite case qui doit être remplie pour expliquer comment est-ce que j'arrive à mon chiffre. Et l'intérêt du process, c'est qu'en fait, toutes les semaines, quand on discute, on ne discute pas de l'idée, on discute de ça. Est-ce qu'en fait, l'hypothèse mathématique, est-ce que je suis d'accord ou pas avec ça euh, il y en a qui sont plus faciles ou plus difficiles que d'autres, hein. c'est sûr, tu vois. Euh, là, si j'en prends, euh, si je prends ça, tu vois, ads geo targeting, je ne sais pas si je mets l'idée, tu vois. Je mets les hypothèses à chaque fois, je l'explique, tu vois. Je dis, bah tiens, là, par exemple, là, on ne target pas bien nos ads d'un point de vue géo. Et donc, j'explique un petit peu, j'essaie de, de faire un breakdown de chaque idée, quoi. Euh, c'est un, un peu la façon dont on fait, quoi, tu vois. Euh, Et pour regarder derrière, en fait, une rétro-analyse sur ce que vous Alors, du coup, euh, j'ai un weekly reporting, du coup, je sais. Euh, combien on a fait. Donc, tu vois, je vois les différentes personnes de l'équipe euh, qui ont travaillé cette semaine. Je vois combien de jours de travail on a mis. Je vois le forecast revenu. Et du, du coup, à côté, bah, je ne peux pas mettre. Mais du coup, j'ai le actual revenu euh, qu'on a réalisé. Et après, je fais le delta euh, ingénieur ou owner par owner entre combien est-ce qu'on a forecast, combien est-ce qu'on a réalisé, quel est le delta. Et après, bah, ça va changer notre confiance sur le mois euh, suivant. Euh, voilà. Et pareil, tu peux avoir la même logique sur les bonus. Tu peux dire, bah, tiens, si cette personne a, est toujours suroptimiste, et en fait, sous des livres, euh, bah, du coup, je vais, je vais prendre ça en compte. Euh, pour info, ce process, euh, dans la, chez Drift, quand je l'ai mis, euh, ça a vraiment poussé les ingénieurs euh, à 
à mieux estimer le temps des ingénieurs, on sont toujours trop optimistes. Hein. Quand, tu, quand ils disent deux jours, c'est toujours quatre jours. Voilà. Mais sauf qu'il n'y a, a aucune conséquence pour eux. Il y a zéro conséquence quand ils disent quatre jours. Enfin, quand, quand, au final, c'est quatre, euh, ou des fois, c'est huit, tu vois. Zéro. Alors que là, du coup, il y a une conséquence. Euh, et donc, du coup, on discute vachement plus dans les détails euh, de, de, des implications du projet. Facebook, en quoi euh, presser tes fausses choses sur le début, que tu sais baisser, baisser ton coup d'édition Ouais, euh, bien sûr. Attends, je vais trouver ça. Alors, le, le, le site n'explique pas grand-chose. Mais, euh, la ouais, ouais. La, la logique, c'est de dire en fait, euh, Facebook, ah, il y a plusieurs façons de targeter sur Facebook. Soit tu crées une audience sur Facebook, c'est difficile d'avoir une audience qui est quand même bien foutue, parce que tu arrives vite sur des audiences qui font un million de personnes, surtout aux US. Euh, dans lequel il y a vraiment de tout et de rien. Voilà. Et euh, le problème, c'est que tu ne peux pas vraiment dire à Facebook, personne par personne, la valeur de chaque personne. Facebook a beaucoup, beaucoup de données qu'ils utilisent sur leur modèle à eux, mais qu'ils ne peuvent pas te partager. Pour, pour de bonnes raisons. Voilà. Et des fois, les mauvaises. Mais euh, voilà. Et donc, du coup, le but du jeu, c'est de faire comme dans l'e-commerce, c'est de dire, bah, tiens, cette personne a telle valeur. Bon, un, un bon parallèle, c'est le, le gaming, le, le, les jeux mobiles. En fait, j'ai trouvé ça quand j'ai voulu recruter quelqu'un qui faisait du paid pour le gaming. Et je me suis dit, bah, je suis en B2B, ça n'est pas relevant du tout. Quoi. Genre, on n'est pas du tout dans le même monde. Euh, et personne me dit, si, 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 tu vas voir. Et donc, j'ai découvert, que dans, je, je ne savais pas, que dans le gaming, il euh, y a à peu près 1% des gens qui drivent à peu près 90% du revenu. D'accord Il y a des gens qui dépensent des centaines de dollars par mois sur un jeu mobile. D'accord Et leur but du jeu, c'est de trouver ces gens-là. Et ils sont prêts à payer 200, 300 dollars pour ce profil-là. Alors, je dis, ouais, effectivement, c'est exactement mon problème. J'ai exactement un problème de scoring. De... Voilà. Et je dis, mais comment tu fais du coup Il dit, bah, en fait, on envoie chaque microtransaction à Facebook. Et Facebook va voir que ça, c'est un gamer qui nous intéresse. Il va regarder leurs autres habitudes euh, behaviorales, donc de, 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 de consommateurs sur Facebook, dire, et trouver des gens qui ont les mêmes habitudes. Quelles pages est-ce qu'ils like euh, Quels sont qu les posts est-ce qu'ils like Qu'est-ce qu'ils font Et il va du coup favoriser la pub pour ces gens-là. Ce que nous, on ne peut pas vraiment faire. Et donc, du coup, j'utilise la même logique d'envoyer mes transactions à Facebook. Je dis, bah tiens, trouve-moi des gens qui ont exactement les mêmes habitudes, individu par individu. Et donc, ah. tu fais custom audience de une personne, quoi. Enfin, ça... Oui, en, en quelque sorte, tu peux penser à ça. Sauf que du coup, après, Facebook les réagrège et trouve en fait les similitudes. Et en fait, du coup, on est en train de traîner l'algo de ML de Facebook euh, en lui envoyant, du coup, euh, le, la population de succès, ce que tu ne peux pas faire autrement, en fait. Euh, donc, voilà. Et donc, du coup, pour faire ça, la seule façon, c'est en fait d'envoyer la conversion en dollars. C'est la seule façon que Facebook accepte pour traîner son algo de ML. Et vu qu'on n'a pas droit en tant que B2B, bah en fait, on fake et on fait des conversions, des conversions B2C. Quoi. Euh, et Facebook s'en fout. Donc, euh, et donc, du coup, nos concurrents souffrent, forcément, parce que du coup, on, on les pousse à overspend complètement et, et ils n'arrivent pas à toucher les clients. Quoi. Donc, ouais. pas ouais. Si tu embauches dans l'équipe grosse et, et au fur et à mesure, tu vois, le, le premier que tu embauches, qu'est-ce qu'il y a ouais. disait... bah, Alors, après, ça dépend si moi, si, on, on a, considérant que moi, je suis le premier. D'accord moi, je ne fous rien. Moi, ma valeur seule est zéro. D'accord euh, Bon, plein de bonnes raisons, mais moi, mon job, en gros, c'est d'avoir des idées et de foutre la paix à l'équipe pour qu'elle puisse bosser euh, quand elle bosse. Euh, et donc, du coup, bah, il faut des gens pour faire. Euh, donc, du coup, moi, ma première ressource, c'est un ingénieur. Euh, un ou une ingénieure. Euh, toujours. Euh, et derrière, euh, j'ai envie de, que ça tourne. Donc, je vais en fait… Bon, après, c'est très différent du US et ici en France, de ce que j'ai appris. Hein. Euh, en fait, en France, les ingénieurs bossent directement avec euh, les gens comme moi. Euh, aux US, il y, 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 y a un tiers de confiance entre les deux euh, dans, la, dans le rôle du PM. Euh, et donc, il y a toujours un PM euh, pour structurer et optimiser le temps de travail des ingénieurs. Euh, parce que le, très, très dur de trouver des ingénieurs, donc on cherche, on cherche à ce qu'ils soient utilisés à 100% du temps. Donc, voilà. Donc, du coup, ça va être d'abord un ingénieur, ensuite un PM, et ensuite, euh, et ensuite ça, ça grossit comme ça. Après, moi, j'ai des équipes qui sont très, très... Euh, euh, porté sur l'ingénierie. C'est-à-dire que si on regarde euh, au moment où je suis parti chez Drift, euh, il y avait sept ingénieurs dans mon équipe, un PM, euh, deux marketeux euh, et moi-même. Et, et du coup, les rôles respectifs de chacun et enfin, les qualités qu'il faut. Euh, de... Des ingénieurs Ouais, des ingénieurs, mais du PM, mais pas. Alors, le... moi, j'aime recruter dans les équipes grosses des gens qui euh, ont eu une, entrepreneuriance, une expérience entrepreneuriale et qui se sont plantés. Euh, il y a plein de bonnes raisons à ça. Bon, déjà, il y en a plein, euh, parce que tout le monde peut être entrepreneur et que 9 boîtes sur 10 euh, échouent. <rire> Donc, ça, c'est super. Euh, et elles échouent pour un tas d'autres raisons que leur capacité euh, propre à leur métier. Il y a plein de gens qui sont en fait de très bons ingénieurs qui ne sont juste pas de bons entrepreneurs. Voilà. Euh, par contre, euh, leur expérience entrepreneuriale les a poussés à avoir 
euh, le focus, l'impact sur le revenu. D'accord Ils ne font, ils font pas du code pour la beauté du code. Ça, c'est important pour moi parce qu'en fait, en gros, on échoue 8 fois sur 10. Et donc, 8 fois sur 10, le code, il va à la poubelle. Et donc, si on est amoureux de son code, ça, c'est problématique. Et en fait, il y a beaucoup d'ingénieurs qui sont amoureux de leur code et qui ont beaucoup de mal et qui vont surinvestir en disant « Ah, je vais faire un produit, ça va être magnifique, t'inquiète pas, Guillaume, encore deux jours, tu vas voir ça. » Mais j'ai rien à foutre. Moi, je veux que ce soit shippé maintenant parce que j'ai envie de, de prouver si l'hypothèse est bonne ou pas bonne. Et j'ai pas besoin d'un truc parfait. Voilà. Et ça, c'est super important. Et donc, du coup, des gens qui étaient le premier ingénieur ou qui étaient cofondateurs en tant qu'ingénieur, ça, c'est c'est top. Voilà. Ils, sont, ils ont super faim, euh, ils n'en ont rien à faire, ils vont tester le truc, ils ont tout à fait compris. Ouais. Yes Du coup, tu as quitté une bonne c'est ça Ouais, il y a à peu près un mois et demi. C'est quoi le prochain coup ouais, Le prochain coup, c'est moi. Euh, C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, là, je suis, euh, je suis en. Comme on dit aux US, je suis un, un fumeur, donc du coup, j'ai une petite boîte de, de consulting où je fais du, du conseil de start-up. Donc, euh, donc voilà avec plusieurs startups et en fait j'essaie d'implémenter les process qu'on a vu là sur plusieurs boîtes en parallèle et l'idée c'est de dire bah tiens plutôt que de prendre une boîte une par une euh, rentrer en tant que 30e 50e et de prendre 18 mois et de sortir à 200 euh, ce qui est toujours ce que je fais parce que c'est là où je suis bon euh, bah, en fait on va essayer d'en prendre plusieurs en, où on va aller stagger quoi on va prendre une 50 on va attendre 6 mois on va rajouter une deuxième à 50 et comme ça ça a une espèce de roulement euh, qui s'opère quoi euh, ouais, en fait, c'est un, une des raisons. C'est qu'en fait, quand j'ai commencé à faire du mentoring, j'ai vu que je pouvais en fait driver. En fait, moi, je, je travaille relativement peu. Hein, euh, et, et en fait, les gens ne comprennent pas, mais je, moi, c'est une fierté. C'est-à-dire que si je suis efficace, euh, je n'ai pas besoin de travailler beaucoup. Euh, J'arrive à avoir une équipe qui bosse bien euh, et qui, du coup, fait les tests. Mais je peux, moi, en bossant plus, les tests ne vont pas aller plus vite. Voilà. Euh, et donc, du coup, la seule façon de faire ça, c'est d'arriver à avoir plusieurs équipes qui font les tests aussi en roulement. Euh, et moi, ma, mon seul apport, c'est de s'assurer qu'on ait les bons process, qu'on ait les bonnes idées euh, et qu'on soit toujours euh, sur, euh, au maximum de l'innovation. Ça, c'est mon job. C'est d'apporter vraiment le côté hyper créatif sur le marketing. Donc, euh, donc ouais. Ouais. Euh, ouais. ouais. Comment tu juges du coup si euh, du, du code, tu peux le, le shipper, que c'est suffisant, que ça va remplir ouais. les conditions techniques suffisantes pour ouais. que ça tienne debout et... Tu n'as pas besoin de trop le tester, etc. Ouais. Ça rejoint un peu ce que tu disais. Alors, non, il y, y a plusieurs questions là-dedans. Euh, déjà, la première question, c'est est-ce que tu es dans l'app et tu risques de casser quelque chose en prod ou pas Voilà. Euh, et mon copain Darius, d'ailleurs, qui a fait ce process chez Dropbox, euh, à qui j'ai posé les exactes questions, euh, je lui dis bah, où est-ce que, est que tu travailles, Darius Parce que il bah, y a des plates-bandes, on marche à plate bande des gens. Et j'ai plein d'histoires là-dedans où j'ai marché sur les plates-bandes des équipes produits et ça s'est mal passé. Et tout le monde, tout le monde en gros, fait des expériences là-dedans. Et il m'a dit, moi, je me focus sur euh, un truc que, euh, qui n'appartient à personne, euh, mais qui est visible par tout le monde. <coughs> sa phrase. Euh, et je lui dis, ok, donne-moi un exemple. Il dit, bah, la page de paiement. Parce que personne ne veut y toucher, euh, mais si j'améliore de 1% pour Dropbox, tout le monde va avoir les résultats. Euh, donc ça, c'est sa façon à lui. Euh, ce que je trouve euh, assez smart. Moi, personnellement, j'essaie de ne pas toucher à ce qui est à l'app. Du tout. D'accord J'essaie de toucher ce qui n'appartient à personne, souvent ce qui est en, en amont de l'app, ou de créer de l'espace complètement. Donc, si on voit par exemple ce que j'ai fait sur le côté euh, euh, avant le funnel, donc tout ce qui est intention d'achat, personne n'est dessus. Et donc, du coup, je, je peux, euh, peux m'approprier cet espace-là. Ce qui est très compliqué, deux choses. Donc, un, quand, quand est-ce que je sais que je peux shipper le code Si je n'insulte personne euh, par mon expérience, voilà, donc si je pense n'est pas insultante, et si je casse rien, c'est tout. Et si c'est le cas, je ship. Voilà, je n'ai pas besoin que ce soit beau. Et, enfin, pardon, si. Est-ce que le résultat va être statistiquement euh, clair voilà. euh, Ou est-ce que mon truc est complètement faussé Mais si je suis capable de shipper un truc qui n'insulte pas l'expérience client et qui euh, va me donner le résultat, j'y vais complètement. Si je peux prouver mon truc, même si c'est mon local. Hein, par exemple, un truc de refer, imagine tu peux mettre un truc de refer dans, dans ton app, tu vois, avec un petit, une petite barre de progression, un, invite des gens pour avoir du crédit en plus, je ne sais quoi. Bon, tu pourrais te faire toute une admin derrière avec des webhooks, des trucs, tout ce que tu veux. Bon, mais en fait, ce que tu veux savoir, c'est est-ce que les gens vont cliquer sur le bouton pour inviter des gens Tu n'as même pas besoin d'avoir la feature. Tu peux faire une fake feature et derrière avoir une page, ah, vas-y, inscris-toi, on te tient au courant pour valider est-ce que les gens sont intéressés. Parce que sinon, tu vas te taper deux mois d'intégration pour un truc que peut-être personne ne va cliquer dedans. Et donc, super souvent, je fais ça, super souvent, je fais des faux produits pour ça. Donc, euh, donc ouais. ouais. Et comment du coup, là-dessus, sur le sujet, tu dis 
aussi du, tu vois, du minimum viable pour valider l'hypothèse que j'imagine que tu vas faire un gars dans l'équipe qui sera honneur par la conférence. Elle va fail, mais il te dira peut-être, moi, ouais, si on avait testé comme ça, on n'est pas allé jusqu'au bout, le design n'était pas là, pour le comment tu fais, il y a un minimum où tu dis. Ouais. Ben alors, dans le process, ils sont censés mettre le temps en jour euh, pour l'hypothèse. Donc, l'hypothèse est invalidée. C'est-à-dire que si au bout du temps qu'ils ont donné, ils ne sont pas arrivés au résultat euh, ou que le résultat n'est pas statistiquement euh, euh, valide, l'hypothèse est invalidée. L'hypothèse est invalidée. Après, ils peuvent faire une nouvelle hypothèse en disant bah, « Tiens, si on rajoute 5 jours, on est arrivé là. » Voilà. Mais du coup, le coût en jour augmente et du coup, la valeur diminue. Donc, du coup, la, plus ça augmente, moins la chance qu'on fasse ce truc-là, en fait, euh, se réalise. Euh, donc, normalement, ça s'auto-ajuste tout seul. Hein. Euh, voilà. Et justement, j'essaie d'éviter le scope creep comme ça. Euh, parce que moi, moi, en tant que bon français, d'ailleurs, aux États-Unis, j'ai tendance à faire des, 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 des belles usines à gaz. Euh, parce que je n'ai jamais réussi à traduire en anglais. Euh, J'adore le truc qui a été là dans tous les sens. Hein, C'est magnifique, tu vois. Mais ça prend un temps fou. Tu vois. Euh, et donc, j'essaie moi-même de m'astreindre à, à limiter ça. pas toujours facile. Hein. Euh, mais ouais. Comment on arrive à bosser avec l'équipe marketing du coup et comment différencier les, les rôles au sein de l'équipe ouais. Parce que tu parlais de créer un, un mode, mais c'est aussi, euh, surtout dans un chef je suppose qu'il enfin, y a pas mal de, de branding. Donc, comment vous arrivez à séparer les rôles et que ça soit clair Ouais, attends, juste euh, laisser ça. Ouais, euh, c'est une bonne question. Euh, généralement, ce que j'aime bien, c'est une équipe, juste remettre ça en fond, en fond d'écran. Euh, Généralement, ce que j'aime bien, c'est une équipe qui, euh, qui est vraiment focus sur ce que moi, je ne fais pas bien. Euh, alors du coup, c'est pas la question, qu'est-ce que je ne fais pas bien bah, Le branding, euh, vraiment le, le côté création de marque, voilà. euh, tout ce qui est euh, marketing traditionnel, l'événementiel, euh, ça va être euh, tout ce qui est création d'une communauté, euh, le messaging, la voix, tout ça, ce n'est pas un sujet où je suis bon et ce n'est pas un sujet où je suis capable d'apporter de l'innovation. Moi, je me focus juste là où est-ce que je suis capable de créer de la différenciation. Tu vois. Euh, et en fait, ma différenciation, c'est d'être capable d'amener des ingénieurs sur du marketing. Alors, on enrobe ça dans du growth et tout pour que ça fasse sexy, c'est super. Hein. Mais c'est ça la différenciation. Euh, là où mes concurrents ne le font pas. Et donc, du coup, d'apporter des réponses, euh, des expériences clients que mes concurrents ne peuvent pas faire. Un, un bon exemple de ça, euh, Pinterest, hein, euh, boîte relativement populaire quand même. Hein. Euh, leur équipe paid marketing, c'est que des ingénieurs. Alors du coup, j'ai demandé à Casey Winters, euh, qui était avant le, le patron de cette équipe, euh, l'équipe Growth chez Pinterest, pourquoi c'était le cas. Il m'a dit, bah, c'est facile. En fait, on avait embauché un tas de gens en paid, puis on, on, on a regardé ce qu'ils faisaient. Qu'est-ce qu'ils font bah, En fait, tous les jours, ils regardent les résultats de la veille, puis ils tournent un petit peu le bouton, hein, dépensent un peu plus par-ci, un peu moins par-là, puis on va ajouter quelques mots-clés par-ci, puis quelques trucs par-là. Voilà. Et en fait, ça, c'est un truc que hein, du machine learning fait super bien. Voilà. Parce que si on a beaucoup de volume, on a beaucoup de données, et en fait, on va juste tourner un petit peu les boutons dans chaque sens. Et en fait, on a juste remplacé ça par une équipe qui fait du ML, un petit peu, il y a juste trois ingénieurs qui font du ML, et du coup, c'est automatisé. Et du coup, ils ont un avantage compétitif. Alors bien sûr, il y a toujours un humain qui écrit le texte, parce qu'il faut écrire des, des, le, le copywriting, mais toute optimisation est automatisée. Et donc ça, c'est ça la logique. Et pareil, sur ce que moi je fais quand l'agrégation de signaux, il y a beaucoup de boîtes qui payent ces signaux-là, qui achètent du Jiju Crowd, de trucs. Mais en fait, qu'est-ce qu'ils en font Et ils échouent tous. Ils les mettent dans Salesforce, et ils disent aux 16, tiens, vas-y, t'as les signaux, euh, débrouille-toi. Hein? Et du coup, c'est ce qu'il fait. Bah, il a une journée bien remplie avec plein de démos à faire. Pff, les signaux du crad qui sont dans, un, dans une vue Salesforce, tout, pff, il ne regarde pas. Quand il regarde, il ne comprend rien. Tu dis, ouais, t'as les boîtes, t'es venu cinq fois et tout, pff, il ne comprend rien. Euh, et donc, du coup, il ne se passe rien. Voilà. Et donc, du coup, moi, j'essaye en fait, d'automatiser cette partie, genre, genre uh, high volume, low conversion, avec du, avec du code. Parce que ce que les humains ne font pas bien. Quoi. Voilà. Généralement, les humains, juste pour info, les, les humains ont, ont, du, ont tendance à abandonner sur un taux de succès dans, en, en, à peu près euh, en dessous de 10%. Si tu regardes des sales, euh, ah, si, alors, mis à part les mormons, qui sont très bons là-dedans, euh, mis, mis à part les mormons, les sales, euh, généralement, en dessous de 10% de taux de réussite sur un, un outreach ou un, un coup d'appel ou un, un entrant, ils vont se dire que c'est une stratégie qui ne marche pas, parce qu'ils se prennent trop de, de portes fermées. C'est des corollaires, c'est aussi pourquoi -ce que la, la plupart des boîtes SaaS euh, ont en fait leur call center en Utah. C'est parce qu'en fait, ils ont, peuvent embaucher des mormons qui en fait ont l'habitude et qui sont super efficaces à ça. Euh, et qui n'abandonnent pas. Parce qu'ils ont l'habitude, ils, ils font ça comme hobby le week-end. Euh, c'est sérieux. Hein. Si on regarde, non, tout, non, c est, c est, si on regarde, si regarde Quadrix, Adobe, ils sont tous, tous les call centers sont là-bas. 
Parce que les mecs qui sont payés à l'heure à 3 francs 6 sous, de toute façon, ils peuvent, je ne veux pas les sortir de l'Utah, et, et ils sont super efficaces et super vendeurs. Donc c'est euh, petite euh, page culturelle. Okay. Merci.